can you be tricked into doing porn? Has the monkey uprising finally begun? Then we travel to Venezuela to meet a cryptid, a spirit of vengeance that stands 19 feet tall. He carries on his back a bag of his father's bloody bones, and his target is you. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. Let's travel first off. We're going to San Diego. So in San Diego, there is a porn company called Girls Do Porn. And it was run by a guy named Michael Pratt. And this was the whole setup to this. This was the whole setup to this. He posts a modeling request on like Craigslist or something like that. And the women would respond, and then he'd be like, uh, let's do nude photos. And she'd be like, no, I kind of don't want to do nude photos. Uh, here, I'll pay you more money. Okay, I'll do nude photos. And this goes on, and then eventually he's able to talk them into shooting porn, shooting actual pornography. And this was his pitch. Now, listen, dude, here's the thing. This is a stupid pitch, and a lot of people fell for it. This is a really stupid pitch. But he said, listen... No one's going to see it, like, well, obviously someone's going to see it, we're shooting porn, but we're only going to sell it via DVD to, like, people in Australia, uh, high-profile businessmen in Japan, uh, deep-sea fishermen, people who don't have access to the internet will get copies of your DVDs. So these women agreed to this, thinking that no one would see their porn except for a highly specialized group of people, and... Then, of course, it got on to the line. Because it wasn't actually a DVD setup. He was actually... The the girls do porn. The whole setup was this. This is the one and only time these women will ever do porn. So, it was about... it. I watched these videos. I'm not a fan of porn. We've talked about this before. I think it's damaging to the people who watch it. I think it's damaging to the performers. But, because of this story, I did watch some of it. There was, like, each video... I couldn't watch all of it. Each video was, like, 55 minutes, an hour long. And the first 10 or 15 minutes was just her being interviewed, like, tell us about your first sexual experience. What turns you on? Something like that. Really kind of just, uh, why would you put that into a porn? I guess it's some sort of fetish thing because you want to get to know the girl better or something like that. But anyways, and then you skip through it and then it's just normal porn stuff. And that's the whole series. And so the idea that this is the first time these girls do porn and this will be the last time they do porn was pretty on the nose because that was how he recruited these women. Oh, don't worry, no one will ever find out about this. He also had a woman, he had like a model accomplice. And this was absolutely disgusting too. Talk about women sticking together. He would say, hey, listen, you got to call this girl. She's worked with me before. She'll give you the straight dope. So the mark, the target, the girl would then call up the model and say, who's like, a, was like an Instagram model or something like that. And and they go, hey, you've worked with this guy before? She'd be like, oh yeah, totally. You know, I've done lots of shoots with this guy and he's totally on the up and up. None of my Instagram fans know about it. None of these photos or videos have ever leaked. You're good to go. None of them leaked because she had never done any porn with this guy as far as I could tell. She was just a contact she was just like a a, a, um she was basically like a collaborator of an enemy state is how this woman was so the girl would go well okay this other woman's vouching for him she says she's done multiple shoots when you would type she he would give him like names like best models incorporated or something like that you would type that in nothing would ever pop up online you go oh she didn't he never said oh i'm with girls do porn because that's all over the place so these girls would then do a porn shoot with him, and then it would be released online, and their lives would be ruined. I actually had a discussion with this girl not too long ago. We were we were talking and talking about sex work. We were talking about pornography, and I said, um, I just, "There's a stigma attached to it." And she goes, "Society needs to change its ways, so a girl can go out and do porn and not have it affect her employment." And I go. What? Yeah, in a perfect world, but the point is you can change your behavior much quicker than you can change society's behavior. You can choose not to do porn today and not to have those ramifications. So, I mean, anyways, these women are actually suing him for being tricked into doing the porn, which seems, when I was reading those headlines, I was like, no, you can't, can you be tricked into doing porn? No, unless it was like hidden camera or something like that. But these women are seemingly successfully arguing that 
They agreed to have sex on camera, but for it not to be disseminated? I don't know. The whole thing's weird. He ended up leaving the country. He, he's gone. He's like in the middle of the trial. He's like, oh, I, I left some paperwork in my car. <clears throat> Drives away. They haven't found him since. His main actor, it was he was the one producing it. He might have been directing it. His main actor is being charged with sexual assault because he wouldn't stop. Like, they'd be like, stop, stop. And actually, no, it's more than that. I was reading about it. He would say, hey, why don't you hang out with me after the shoot? And then he would sexually assault, allegedly sexually assault them. Or they would make arrangements at a hotel and be like, oops, your hotel room got canceled. You have to stay with me and stuff like that. So it seems to be a pretty scummy operation all around. The woman collaborator, that's disgusting. Um, if these allegations are true, they're, they're, they're disgusting. The actor's disgusting and the director producer's disgusting. What's interesting is that's actually a plot point for the movie Cuck. I know I've talked about that almost every day now. It's, but um, he gets the same thing. They say, hey, we're just shooting these movies for us. So come and do these Cuck videos. And he's like, oh, okay. And then they get online. And at that point, he's a popular youtuber it's pretty it's a it's a fairly interesting movie but anyways anyways enough about cuck enough about porn but still an interesting question nonetheless how does the porn industry is basically just a meat grinder and uh, and it's a terrible terrible thing and the best thing you can do stop watching porn let's go ahead and move on to our next story here uh, you know what here's a question for you i wonder if you read a book, you imagine this wonderful world in the book. You're like, oh, Bella, if only you would find out that Edward was the right... Edward was actually a terrible mate for Bella. They're a horrible couple. I wonder what they'd be like in their 50s. Like, they're vampires. 50s is like nothing to them. I think he's already like 200. But I wonder what they'd be like married for, you know, a couple hundred years. Because they were terrible for each other. Anyway, so you read books and it helps your imagination. Or you... I guess it's like a muscle and you're using it. When you watch television... You can then go, hmm, I wonder if Rachel and Ross are ever going to get together. Or what is really behind the number sequence and Lost? You can tell, obviously, I'm a boomer. Um, so you have that stuff, right? But with porn, because we see these effects on the brain, we're always hearing these studies about effects on the brain. It definitely affects men's sexual, not drive, but they can't, get, they can't keep it up. They might be able to get it up just as quickly as normal, but they can't keep it up. Because their brain has been taking in the stimulus of these images, these multiple images. And the compilation videos are even worse because you're just getting totally different images each, you know, every 30 seconds, if that. But when you're watching a movie, you're seeing the visual information presented in front of you. And then you can go, hmm, I wonder if, you know, Gandalf is going to get out of this one. When you're watching porn, I don't even think any part of your imagination is engaged. Maybe you're imagining yourself in the scene, but I don't even think that. And I'm wondering if that, if pornography might actually be the most deadening, quote unquote, f entertainment that is out there. Because no one's ever like, hmm, I wonder if Jenna Jameson will get together. I am old, by the way. <laughs> I am old. Who, I don't even know who the new stars are. I guess Mia Khalifa is the, the newest one I know. She's retired at this point. I wonder if Jenna Jameson's going to get together with Rock Studley. Maybe I'll write fan fiction about that. I don't think it engages the brain on a creative level at all. You're a truly a passive observer. Even with video games, you're constantly trying to figure out, if I do this, I'll, I'll win. If I do that, I'll lose. Mega Man 2? Metroid? So I just threw in some old game references as well, just to do the complete package there. So, interesting though. Let's go ahead though, and leave behind those interesting questions. Let's head off to a little place in Africa. Uganda. Everyone's favorite African country. I don't even know where it's at. I couldn't point it out on a map, except the fact that it's in Africa. We're in Uganda. Now, what's happening over here is we are basically having a human chimp war. Now, listen, man. In America, you could walk out of your house one day. You have a one in a billion chance that a mountain lion's going to attack you. And it's actually pretty, it's pretty low rates. In California, at least it was. I think it's been 10 people in 100 years. And if you go around, you're poking, poking around in the woods with a shotgun, stuff like that. There's a chance a bear is going to eat you. When you're in the cities, it's less likely, or in towns, it's less likely that a mountain lion is going to get you. I remember when I was in California, there was this horrifying story. This woman, she lived kind of in the, in the, in the mountains, but not like super remote. She wasn't like Ruby Ridge level living in the mountains. She came out of her house and she had like a patio. She walks out of her house. She walks down the stairs of her patio. 
There was a mountain lion sleeping underneath the patio, and it heard her walking and woke it up, and it ate her. It just devoured her at 6 a.m. That's That was terrifying. <laughs> Everyone in California, when that news article hit the papers, were like, ugh. People could be in the middle of L.A. Some homeless guy's like, uh-oh, I'm glad I'm homeless so I don't have a patio so a mountain lion can't hang out underneath it. When you live in a place with chimpanzees and gorillas, which is not like most people don't, even places where chimpanzees and gorillas live, they tend to be farther off. But there's a chance you're going to get killed by a chimp, which is they are brutal attackers. If you have a choice between being thrown into a cage with a bear or thrown into a cage with a chimp, take the bear. Because the chimp is going straight for your genitals. Like, the bear is going to slap you and it's going to disfigure you. And then it's going to bite down and kill you. A chimp is going to rip off your hands and your feet. and your. It's going to start with your genitals, by the way. And then it's going to rip off your hands and your feet. And then it may kill you, if you're lucky. Or you just die of blood loss. Very, very grim. Chimp wins the fight. Goes on to fight against Shao Kahn in Mortal Kombat. But we're having these problems in Uganda because humans tend to spread out. Like all species, like all species, they will spread out until they can't go anywhere else. They'll spread out as far as their environment will allow them. But humans are masters of the environment, so they can go anywhere. Grasshoppers get to a point where it gets a little cold, and they're like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to stay in this area. Humans will be like, cold, and they'll colonize the most frigid environments on the planet. Call them... Oregon and make me live there in the year 2019 we're having these problems with these villages in Uganda butting up against chimpanzee habitats not like Jane Goodall she's like they're being observed like wild chimps 2014 is when these have started they've really ramped up this woman these are these are going to get kind of gross by the way and not in a pornography is a social ill gross these are actually like human chimp attack gross This mom, right there, that should let you know where this is going. This mom is hanging out with her kids in her yard. A little house in the middle of Uganda. And the kids are like, can we get some water, mama? Can we get some water? Oh, that's dark. Don't make make children voices, Jason. She goes to get water, and she hears screaming. She comes back around the house. And a chimpanzee just ran out of the jungle, grabbed her two kids, and started dragging them off. And now she's chasing, and the chimpanzee drops one of the kids, but takes her two-year-old son and runs into the jungle. When they find the kid later, he's dead. I'm going to spare you the gruesome details, but I've pretty much gone over what chimpanzees do to human body. Now, obviously, everyone was super panicked about that. What are we going to do? We have to go out and kill these chimps, things like that. But... I mean, there's there's hundreds of these guys. It's not like if there was just King Kong walking around New York City. Like, whenever an, an alligator eats someone, they tend to kill the alligator. But it's a chimp. There's a bunch of them. There's, there's, I know they're endangered, but they're endangered, like, worldwide. In this area, there's a ton of them. You can't go kill, and you can't go kill every chimp, because then you'll have environmentalists all over you saying these guys are endangered. They're in, um, in 20, and they've just have, they've been having all of these attacks Going on like this, in 2017, there was another incident that was notable, other than just a monkey coming out of the woods and stealing somebody. This uh, monkey takes a baby, takes off into the jungle. You're like, Jason, please don't tell me stories about monkeys killing babies. Monkey takes a baby. It's Jason just continues. Monkey takes a baby, takes off into the woods. Mother chases it. When she gets into the woods, she gets surrounded by chimps herself, or a semicircle would probably be more apt. And she backed off. And the monkeys ate the baby. It's bizarre. And you read that and you're like, what would you do? I I think that's, I left that one in as gruesome as it is. I left that one in because I think it's very chilling. Because as a parent, I'm not a parent, thankfully. But if I was a parent, you want to think if a chimpanzee stole your kid, you would fight to the death to get it back. But... I mean, at a point where, maybe, but at the point where there's 10 chimpanzees and you have other kids at home, what would you do in that situation? You're like, Jason, this is not a fun podcast. This is not a fun podcast. You're talking about moral questions about how it, one baby versus 10 babies. Speaking of 10 babies, there was a chimpanzee that was so vicious they nicknamed them Saddam. They nicknamed this uh, chimpanzee Saddam. He, him alone, 
Saddam alone ate seven babies. And then they finally shot him. So, not, there's not, they're not having a good time in Uganda. And, I thought this was interesting. The little, little chimpanzee facts to kind of lighten the mood. You're like, Jason, <laughs> how many babies are going to be eaten in this episode? I think that's the end of it. Oh, wait. Those are the only babies that are going to be eaten this episode. <laughs> okay? But anyway, so some eight facts. Here's some, or chimpanzee facts. I think the first fact is they're not called apes. They're called chimpanzees. Monkey, I think, is the generic term, right? Like, all of them are monkeys. And then a chimp is a particular, particular. Chimps are a particular breed. And then apes are the big, are the middle dudes. And then gorillas are the giant guys. I should do a, I should do a, a natural science podcast. Apes are the giant guys of the world. Wait, no, I didn't even say that. Gorillas are the giant guys of the world. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Ch- so we're mostly related to the chimpanzee. We, as humans were evolving, we had a choice. We could either have immense strength. Chimpanzees are about two times as strong as humans. Some people say five times as strong, but modern science doesn't really think that. They're at least two times as strong as humans. Though. Humans had a choice. We could either remain as strong as we were, or we could develop fine motor skills. They said that the fact... That we can, I, we can both pick up a grape and like wield a sledgehammer is fine motor control. Use scissors, things like that. We can be very gentle. Scissors, <laughs> chopping stuff up, or just that's something a chimp can't do. They, they're all strength. So yeah, I don't know. That was an interesting <laughs> chimpanzee effect. And and you go, okay, Jason, you've told us about monkeys killing people, eating babies. Disgusting topic for a podcast. In Uganda, it's been going on now for five or six years. That's terrible. But you mentioned a monkey uprising. And I will say this. The monkeys are rising up. In 2007, they, so in um, India, they also have a trouble with monkeys. Little, little tiny monkeys, though. These are like the little monkeys from Aladdin. They're 2D. They're animated. Just throw some dip on them. Get rid of it. I don't know why they have such a problem. These little monkeys are running around India. There's like this diplomat's house and people have quit working for the diplomat because monkeys are constantly breaking into the house, pulling their hair and stuff like that. And you're like, Jason, that's not comparable to chimpanzees eating babies. You didn't let me finish. You didn't let me finish. In 2007, I love this sentence. In 2007. So I love that this is, I got this from an article here. In 2007, a group of monkeys pushed then deputy mayor of Delhi, S.S. Bajwa, off a terrace where he fell to his death. They're basically political assassins at this point. You have like some shady guy like paying, <laughs> paying them in bananas. Here you go. Ten bananas now. Ten bananas after the job's done. The monkeys are like, yes. And they're like sneaking through the house. They push him off his terrace. He falls to his death. My question is, where was Lady Gaga in 2007? That's a deep cut. That's a deep cut. And if you don't get that joke, Listen to episode six of Dead Rabbit Radio. I don't do in-jokes often, but I, I couldn't pass that one up. The <laughs> most obscure in-joke ever. Sorry, new listeners. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our last topic of the night. This one was actually a request from Gustavo Hernandez, and he requested this during, I think, my first live stream. I think it was my Halloween live stream. Let's hop in the carpenter copter. We're leaving behind the army of monkeys. They're dressed like little ninjas. We're going to Venezuela. We're headed back in time to the 19th century. So we're going to hear the story of El Saban. Sit back, relax as much as you can (laughs) for the the content of the rest of this episode. You're like, I can't relax at all. I've already shut the podcast off. I'll wait for tomorrow's episode. There's like a guy playing a mandolin in... Venezuela. We're walking down the dusty streets. That was too racist. I'm sure their streets are just as clean as everyone else's streets in the 19th century. It's the 19th century. Anyway, so we're walking through Venezuela. Everyone's looking at us suspiciously now. They're like, did he just assume that Venezuelan streets are dusty? Who is this guy? So anyways, we're in Venezuela and we're going to meet a dude now, his real name's not El Sabon. Uh, El means the. So I don't think when he was born, they're like, I will name thee the. The Silbon. Or Mr. Silbon. Silbon probably stands for something. I probably should have checked it out. Let me find out exactly what Silbon means. One second here. 
Oh, the whistler. So bone means whistler, I believe. And which makes sense, because he does a whistle. So anyways, but he wasn't, that's not his given name. He wasn't from the whistler family. His first name isn't the. Anyways, there's this story in town. The guy's playing the mandolin. Dun, dun, dun. You guys want to hear a story? And we're like, yes. And he's like, sit down on our immaculate, perfectly paved streets. We're like, oh, these are quite clean. He's like, yes, you can eat off them. Don't be racist, Jason. So there was a young man named Whistler. And he had a beautiful wife. And he lived at home with his mom and his dad. And one day, he was walking. And he heard odd sounds coming from his house. Jason almost said hut. But he caught himself. Oh, I love you, my husband's father. I guess I could have just called you my father-in-law. Yes, I love you too, daughter-in-law. That sounds absolutely disgusting. Can I call you something else? Why, yes, you can call me. And then Whistler kicks on the door and goes, Dad, are you boning my wife? And the father is like, yes, I am boning your wife. What are you going to do about it? You feeling froggy? And uh, the Whistler was feeling froggy. He stabbed his father to death, killed him right on the spot. Now, the grandfather, so his dad's dad, if you if you needed any more exposition on that one, Thinks this is disgusting, and it takes the whistler out, ties him to a tree, whips him. That's pretty bad, cutting your skin open with a whip. Every time you get hit, it just puts a big slice in your skin. But grandfather's not done. He then goes and grabs a bunch of chili peppers, just rubs them all over his back. Ah, ah, this is somehow worse than getting my skin ripped open. Ah, ah. Then... He gives his... Then, then the grandfather gives Whistler... A bag of his father's bones, which seems a little insane. Like, you're like, no, my son was murdered by my grandson. Okay, you hold on. I'm going to go chop up your dad and skin him and then give you a bag of his bones. Like, I don't know why this was so ready to go. Grandfather gives him a sack of his father's bones and says, run. And the was like, ah. He untied him, too, before he said that. He didn't just keep him tied up and say, run. So you have a guy with his back all whipped up, a bunch of hot chilies rubbed into the wounds, carrying a bag of his father's bones, and now he's being commanded to run. And then the grandfather unleashes a pack of dogs on... How did the grandfather have... How did the grandfather have all this stuff just laying around? First off, he had a sack big enough to hold human remains. Two, he had human remains. Three, he had a pack of dogs just hanging out. Anyways, the dogs chase Whistler down. Chasing the bones, really, I think is kind of what that's supposed to be. And then they catch him, and they eat him, and they kill him. And the narrator, this mandolin goes, that's one version. And we're like, oh, okay. So there's another version of the story. He's like, yes. Whistler was a Nazi child. Whistler was a young man who wanted what he wanted. And he goes, I want venison. And his father goes, you know what, son? I love you so much. I will go out and get you some venison. And he was always like a spoiled brat. The father went out to go get him some venison. He goes hunting, couldn't find any deer. So he comes back and he's like, well, I know my son's a spoiled brat, but I'm sure he'll understand. So he comes and he goes, son, I'm going to find you any deer. And the son's like, okay, so here's the thing. Listen, I really wanted some venison that's what i said right dad and dad's like yeah and then whistler goes so you know what else is a tender tender meat slits his father open Mm, delicious dad Mm -mm. (laughs) yummy 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 i love eating my forefathers he takes the stuff he takes the organs to his mom and says hey dad caught this venison can you cook this up i can't wait to eat and the mom's like oh yeah sure when's your dad coming home and he's like ah oh, he'll be in a bit and then the mom's like holding it she's like that's weird this feels like this feels like my husband's liver hmm these intestines i recognize these these look like they come from my my husband and she realizes what happened she lets the grandfather know the grandfather shows up whips whistler Throws, puts her hot chili peppers on his back. Bag of his father's bones. Again, just ready to go. Like a snack pack. And then the dogs chase after him. We're like, that is really... So basically one version, the son is kind of wronged. He's getting vengeance for his dad banging his wife. The second version, he's just a spoiled kid. Narrator goes, 
Yeah, but there's another version. We're like, oh, okay. Is it is it wildly different than either version we've ever heard? And the narrator goes, quite. It's quite odd. It's a quite different variation of this. The Whistler is an awful kid. And so that has something in common with that. So awful that he basically sex, drugs, rock and roll. Like, he's just out of control. He ends up going to prison for a crime that's not really detailed. And in prison... He tries to figure stuff out and goes, you know, maybe I should be a better son. Maybe I should be a better person. He ends up getting out of prison, goes home. And one day he's walking with his father down by the river. And he goes, hey, dad, you see that tree there? See that tree there? It's all crooked and bent. Could you straighten that tree out? And father goes, well, you know, when it was a young tree, I probably could have straightened it out. Like, we could have done things to correct it so it would grow strong and tall. But at this point now, it's crooked. And the son goes, that's what I thought. You see, when I was a kid, you could have straightened me out. You could have done things to make me strong and tall. But now I'm just too crooked and bent. And that's your fault. <laughs> Slits his guts open. His father... Falls to his knees, guts pouring out. Whistler standing over him. <laughs> he didn't laugh. That's not in the legend. But that ver- and then and then the grandfather finds out whipping chili peppers, dogs, and the bag of bones. So that version, they're, they're all radically different, really. <clears throat> One of them, the kid is truly wronged. There wasn't even a fourth version where the father killed, was banging his wife, and then killed his wife. And then so the interesting thing about the story is that it's half. Spirit. Some versions, he's a spirit of vengeance, and some versions, he's a spoiled brat. And so that's where things get complicated, because a lot of times these cryptids represent some sort of, uh, like, moral lesson. And El Saban, his, his origin story is so wildly different that it's hard to say what the moral lesson is. And even his targets. So this creature is now a 19-foot-tall apparition. And who will kill you? And this is his target list. And it's funny, at the beginning of the podcast, I said his target is you. I don't know why I said that, because I... Well, he, you might be. So let me read this. These are his main victims. Men cheating on their wives. Which is really weird victim class. We've run into a bunch of cryptids that do that, but I'm always a little surprised. And I get it, probably the people who are mostly telling these cryptid stories, these folk tales over the years, are most likely housewives. So they're like... Yes, and then the guy cheated on his wife, and his stomach was ripped out, and the kids are like, oh, I'll never cheat on my wife. But, I mean, it's still, it's an interesting victim class nonetheless. Drunkards. He has a special penalty for drunkards. If you are an alcoholic, I don't even know if you have to be an alcoholic. I just think you might have tied one too many on. You're walking home. You pass out in the middle of the road. Hopefully not in the middle of the road. You pass out in the bushes or something like that. Elsa Bond will walk up to you. Put his mouth to your belly button and suck the alcohol out. Which, to me, is doing me a favor. If I'm so drunk, I've passed out of the side of the road. And then I wake up and there's another man sucking the alcohol out of my belly button. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little weirded out. But, you know, we might be able to make this work. We might be able to make this cryptid work. He also attacks, this is where it gets weird, pregnant women. He's sucking belly button alcohol out of the, out of the hobos. But when I say attack, he's killing people who cheat on their wives. He's killing pregnant women. He's also killing just random people, innocent people. So if you're not a drunkard, if you're a drunkard, you're getting off pretty good. So I guess the moral of the story is if you live in Venezuela, be a hardcore alcoholic. Otherwise, this guy's going to kill you. Now, he's called the Whistler because he whistles. Now, he has this little do-do-do-do-do. And it's a trick. He loves whistling. That's not that's not a trick. It's a real hobby of his. But if you hear the whistle far away, that means he's right behind you. But if you hear it super close to you, that means he's far away. Which is kind of a stupid trick. It should be if you hear it close to you, he's right behind you. And if he, you hear it far away, he's right behind you. I don't understand the point of him being right next to you, whistling in your ear and you being safe. He also has this weird thing where he comes to your house late at night. He lays down his bag of bones outside your door, and he'll count them. And you're like, well, Jason, it's his dad's bones. You think he would already know. I forgot to tell you this. When he kills you, he strips the meat off your bones and throws your bones in the bag. So it actually gets harder and harder for him to count. As time goes on, he throws the bag of bones by your front door, and he counts the bones one by one. 
if you wake up, if the, if you hear the noise and you wake up and you go, hey, what's going on? You get good luck. Because he leaves. Well, that's the first part of good luck. There's no longer a 19 foot tall monster outside your door. He leaves. He bounces out. But if he counts every single bone and no one wakes up, someone in the house is going to die. That's stupid. Because I can tell you right now there's like, what, 103 bones in the human body or something like that? You're telling me this dude's counting toe bones and stuff like that? How many bones are just in the tail? Tail bone of a human is stupid. Plus, every time he kills someone, he's adding more bones. It's, it doesn't make sense. Otherwise, he'd be like 10,001, 10,000. You're obviously going to wake up to that because eight days have gone to pass. At some point, you're going to get up to go get the newspaper, there's a 19-foot-tall monster counting bones on your driveway. You're like, hey, man, what's up? I guess I got good luck. And he's like, I guess you do. Walks off. Heads off to the nearest bar. <laughs> the, the parking lot of the nearest bar. Then we get to his weaknesses, which I love weaknesses. His weaknesses are sounds. This might be one of the easiest cryptids to defeat. He'll run away if he hears any of these two sounds. The sound of a whip. <laughs> So just have a copy of Indiana Jones wherever you're at. Just have a little portable DVD player ready to go. The sound of a dog barking. Seriously, dude? So everyone, so basically you can't go into any neighborhood. Ever. There's dogs everywhere. He hates sounds of dog barking. Also, he hates chili peppers. I'm going to have to say that this guy needs to leave South America. I, I mean, there's not a lot of whips down there, but there's a lot of dogs and there's definitely a lot of chili peppers. So this guy, and thanks for the recommendation too, Gustavo. I don't think I said that earlier. Uh, generally with these stories, they're moral lessons. And the moral lessons tend to start in the beginning. You had a woman who was vain. She becomes a monster. You had a woman who was sleeping with a priest. She becomes a horse with no head. This one, there's no definitive answer to who this guy is. The, the only thing we know, the only thing that's similar in all these stories is how he died. I think some people want to make him out as an avenging angel who kills men who cheat on their wives and attacks drunkards. And other people have turned him into this bent figure that will attack anyone on sight. So who knows where this story came from? The fact that they all have the same ending makes me think that they are from some sort of central source. Which can sometimes mean that the original legend itself is true, i.e. a man was killed by his grandfather with whips, chili peppers, and then forced to carry a bag of bones while being attacked by dogs. That may have happened at some... I'm sure that's happened at some point in human history, but that may have happened in Venezuela. This legend is also spread to Colombia at this point as well, but it's a Venezuelan legend to start off with. But what is the moral lesson behind this cryptid? Is it truly a creature that stalks the night, just attacking people randomly? Or is, it, is, or is it trying to correct the wrongs that his own father did by cheating on his mother with the Whistler's own wife? The only way you'll know which story is true is if you hear that whistle one night. And if you do, just remember. If you hear it close, you're safe. If you hear it far away, it's right behind you. But that's if that part of the legend is true as well. But who knows, that part of the legend may be wrong as well. You may hear that whistle close by and think, I'm safe. I'm fine. And everyone else who thought the same thing ended up in that bag of bones. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.